Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today, today's show where you can access all of our archive recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to for anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think would be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Uh, that would be similar to your state library. And so we provide services and programs and resources to all types of libraries in the state. Uh, so you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, uh, corrections, museums, archives. Uh, really, our only top uh, criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on the show and talk about um, resources and programs and things we're doing here to the commission. But we also bring on guest speakers, uh, which we have to have done today. Uh, Join us this morning is uh, Caitlin Lombardo. She is from our Lincoln City Libraries right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she's going to talk to us about uh, tabletop role playing, gaming, and D&D, which is awesome. I'm wearing my D&D shirt. I don't know if you notice it has a D&D logo on it. <laughs> um, my husband, myself, my friends, we play for years and years. <laughs> but I will hand it over to you. Uh, Caitlin, tell us how you're doing it at the library with your team. Yes. Um, so I have been doing um, tabletop gaming in my library, um, which is the central branch here in Lincoln, um, in terms of kind of helping you figure out scale. Um, and I have been doing it consistently since March of 2022. Um, started as a spring break, uh, what we're going to have teens do uh, productively in the library and kind of became this uh, lovely big monster. Um, <laughs> So my email is down there at the bottom, and uh, it's also on the last slide. So if anybody wants um, any extra uh, handouts and stuff that I have, um, and they'll also go to Krista for posting uh, with the slides. Yep, yep um, we'll have the slides. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it, we'll have the slides along with the recording um, when that's uh, posted for, uh, in our archives. Perfect. Um, and then I'm also working on doing a Zoom Zero session. Um, as kind of an example. So if you're interested in joining that as well, you can email um, me there. Um, so what is D&D? &D? Um, it's uh, Dungeons and Dragons is what it's short for. And it is one system for tabletop gaming. There are many systems. D&D um, &D is the one that I'm personally more familiar with, um, but I've listed uh, a bunch of other systems here. The idea is that it's collaborative storytelling around a table, whether that's physical or virtual, using the player's imagination and creativity to create the story characters and world. Um, and like I said, d and is kind of the most popular one, but you know, there's a whole variety. The IRL lore is that it was created by Gary Gygax and uh, Dave Arneson in 72, and it was inspired by Lord of the Rings. They set it in uh, kind of a Lord of the Rings world. And the idea was that they would have a single player that they would follow through this storyline the character skills would um, improve and they would have different puzzles to, to face and uh, villains to battle. Um, and that they would have that same character over a long series of time. Um, they were originally published uh, on their own, but it was purchased by uh, Wizards of the Coast in 1997. Um, if you're familiar with Hitchhiker's Guide, some would call that a bad move, um, but it is what it is. D&D uh, in pop culture, um, a lot of you may be familiar with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Community, Gravity Falls, She-Ra, they have all had like the D&D &D episode. There's also a lot of podcasts and real plays like Critical Role, which has turned into uh, Vox Machina on uh, Amazon Prime, I believe, uh, illustrated uh, kind of show. 
uh, role in the family is a family friendly um, real play, uh, kids and adults playing together. There's also friends at the table. Uh, Dimension 20 is a part of the dropout um, family of programs. So if you're familiar with dropout, it's a little bit, you know, maybe more adult specific content and the adventure zone. And then of course, Stranger Things, the entire show is kind of uh, based on the D&D world. Um, so some of the anatomy of uh, the D&D game, some important terms to know. The DM, that's the dungeon master. They're kind of the admin. Um, they're the one who is moderating, running encounters, um, you know, choosing villains. Depending on your group, they may be the ones keeping track of hit points and um, that sort of statistical data. But keep in mind that the DM also makes and breaks the rules. Mm -hmm. Breaks being the key there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, decide to do whatever they want. <laughs> yep. The player is in control of one character, making decisions for that character. The setting is the fictional fictional world you've placed it in. The plot provides structure, um, sets some goals for the players. And then the IRL stuff would be like dice, maps, uh, figurines, character sheets, the admin. And a lot of groups have what's called the snack captain, the person who makes sure that there is a uh, snack and drink on the table. Um, so how to play. This is a nice little video you are welcome to look at outside of this. This is just a photo for our purposes, but this bit.ly will lead you straight there. Um, it is a Dungeons and Dragons produced video that kind of gives you the bare bones of how to get started in seven minutes. So it's kind of a nice um, starter tutorial. Um, as well on that website, there's a number of other uh, tutorials once you kind of get deeper into playing. Um, I referenced se session zero earlier. So when you start your group, session zero is a chance for the dungeon master. Usually, uh, in my case, I'm the dungeon master for my teens. Um, and I think that tends to be the way it works um, for most, most libraries. Um, session zero allows the DM to kind of share a little bit about the world that you'll be moving around in um, and maybe give uh, clues as to what kind of skills might be useful or um, what kind of mechanics they might be looking at. Um, if it's a new uh, situation, you know, it's the first time you're holding this program, it might be a nice chance to also do some icebreakers and things like that so the teams are comfortable with each other as well. Um, but thinking about, you know, like everybody kind of hates icebreakers, um, something that we found um, pretty uh, useful for our group was icebreakers as your character. So the character that you want to create is, are they shy? Or is the character you want to create really funny and have your icebreakers reflect that character? Um, they also get to, uh, gives a chance for the DM to kind of gauge some play styles, interests so that I can shape the game in that direction um, if I so choose. So now we get to the fun part. This is the, the character creation portion. Um, so the stats that uh, help you shape a character are strength, dexterity, uh, intelligence, wisdom, those two things are different, charisma and constitution. So strength is how hard you smash the tomato. Dexterity is how well you dodge a thrown tomato. Intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put a tomato in a fruit salad. Charisma is being able to convince someone to eat a tomato-based fruit salad. And constitution is not getting sick after eating the tomato fruit salad. So that kind of gives you a nice way to explain it and understand it yourself when you are making these characters. Some species that you might run into uh, would be dwarf, elf, halfling, human, dragonborn, gnome, half elf, half orc, and tiefling. You'll notice there are no wizards, warlocks, or sorcerers on here because they are so hard uh, to work with in beginner situations. Um, I have intentionally kind of limited my beginner teens to this group of species um, because it's just, it's a lot for a beginning player to um, try to manage a sorcerer. And if I have 13 other teens, a, a sorcerer has a very specific set of skills that are very different from some of these others. Um, this is also kind of a nice place to get into um, some of the uh, previous problems, some of the things that were previously problematic about D&D. 
um, species used to be called races. Um, and races used to have specific characteristics tied to them, skills and things like that. Uh, D&D is moving away from that um, because there's some obvious like race racism uh, inherent in that system. Um, so uh, spe uh, the species classifications are more about um, backstory and things like that that help uh, bring the character to light. There are some skills uh, that like elves and half elves have better vision, things like that that aren't so much um, tied to success of one species over another. And then class is your character's job, essentially. So back to the tomato um, analogy, we have the barbarian, they're gonna smash that tomato. Bard is gonna sing about the tomato. The cleric might heal the tomato. The druid will grow the tomato. The fighter will stab the tomato. A monk will flip and kick the tomato. A paladin will smite them. The ranger will shoot the tomato. The rogue will steal the tomato. Sorcerer will zap it. Warlock will summon a tomato eating monster and a wizard will study the tomato. Um, now up at the top here, I have uh, Dempsey and Davis. They are a TikTok comedian duo that does a lot of um, Dungeons and Dragons content. And that mm -hmm. bit.ly will lead you to the TikTok if you uh, want to jot it down. But I did send a video to Krista to hopefully mm -hmm. play it for you all. Yeah. So do that here. Yeah, hold on a sec. I'm going to switch right over to my screen quickly and then we'll switch back. There it is. If I punch hard enough, this goblin will die. If I pray hard enough, this goblin will die. If I sing loud enough, this goblin will die. If my backstory is tragic enough, this goblin will die. Fireball! <laughs> I love the egg. I'm the wizard, yeah. <laughs> and that wizard is a, kind of the reason why wizards are not a starter, <laughs> a starter sort of uh, character. Um, but yeah, they, they also have a lot of other content um, to help you um, understand game mechanics. So. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to send back presenter control to you. Okay. So you go ahead and there share your screen again. Perfect. There you go. Yes. Um, so the backstory is what those uh, TikTok characters were based on, um, and that is thinking about where your character is from, what they're doing at the starting point of the game, why are they on the adventure, and then how does your character get along with others. Um, this is important uh, because a lot of characters, or a lot of uh, adventures rather, will have um, end goals of treasure or have end goals of information. And if your character is on the search for information that will uh, liberate their village, or they're uh, on the search for gold to help pay off somebody's debt, something like that, that helps them guide what kinds of decisions they will make throughout the game. Um, and deciding how your character gets along with others um, is going to inform a lot of that repartee that happens um, when they're discussing what decisions to make, or if there's somebody who doesn't get along with anybody, maybe they just make a choice and do what they want and everybody else kind of has to deal with the consequences. Um, so there's some of that, uh, the, the drama aspect there in the backstory. Um, well, a lot of those, you're, you're playing a, another character, so it's kind of, kind of like acting. Yeah. Like if, if you're coming up with a character that's not like yourself, but some people I know they uh, kind of say, well, I'm just going to be me and I'll do yeah. all, you know, and see like, how I would react in all these situations in this yeah. kind of just new world. So there's, you know, for some people I know, like for myself, I have trouble coming up with a whole backstory and why am I doing this? I don't know. I yeah. just want to have fun and play with some of these people and see what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. I kind of go with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's there uh, are certain backstories that will give you. Uh, you know, certain sets of tools and stuff like that that can be uh, useful if you're a thief or a rogue. Um, but yeah, they're they're uh, mostly inform your your interactions. Um, another way to look at that is what's called an alignment chart. Just a suggestion, um, and it's not not by any means cement, right? Like your character could start out as lawful good and realize over the course of the adventure, maybe they need to be true neutral or somebody could start out as lawful evil and progress to lawful good. Um, that's totally acceptable. And it just kind of, again, guides uh, decision-making and that sort of thing, thinking about who uh, who that character really is. Um, 
believe, yes, yeah, so this is my um, kind of handle here. But um, what I would say as far as practicality and like actually doing it, I have two meetings per month with my Dungeons and Dragons group, the second and fourth Monday of each month. And we meet in the teen room, so it's visible to uh, any teen walking in the library. And it's also, if you've ever been to my library, it's on the main floor. So um, anybody who is coming in the library would see that there are, you know, teens doing stuff. It kind of makes it more visible that there are mm -hmm. events happening. Mm -hmm. um, be, beyond that, we have um, the table set up um, and a map in the middle so everybody can see. I also bring. Um, extra dice because invariably somebody will have forgotten their dice um you can buy little dice sets i don't know if you can see on the camera but you can buy little dice sets on amazon and we got like a, a multi-pack of these um dice sets um and having a six-sided dice uh eight-sided 12-sided 20-sided four-sided and then a percentage dice are usually um going to help you out from most most cases um but again this would be one of those things where a dungeon master can make and break the rules so um for my characters or for my teens a lot of their characters are like kind of troublemakers and they're just going to try to do the most outrageous solution uh to any problem so they may promote or try to uh persuade me um oh could my could my character um uh use my animal handling skill to persuade this ox to you know bash through the door or something like that and there's not much precedent for that but if you roll a nat 20 on your which is a you get 20 out of 20 points on rolling a, a 20 sided die if you get a nat 20 i might let the ox go through the door but i, did, I kind of decided the dm does it serve the story for the ox to go through the door if they shouldn't be going through that door and it's locked and I'm trying to steer them to a different room, yeah. I could say, nope, this ox is, does not speak uh, common. This this ox doesn't speak or, or whatever language. I can kind of shut it down and just say, as the DM, I'm guiding you in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning, when I was kind of training teens, I did all, also say things like, um, the invisible hand of the DM is saying, maybe you shouldn't do that. And then once you kind of get a feel for the kids, then you maybe um, have a little bit better improv as to what uh, what elements you can use to uh, steer them back onto the path. Um, and they kind of learn too how what's the what is the <clears throat> acceptable or logical thing that might happen. I mean, getting creative is great. Yeah. Thinking of those things, which I think some DMs are like, oh wow, you just threw a whole wrench into this, but I like it. Let's see if it. Yeah, let's see where it goes. I had never thought about that. But you know there are still limits to what everyone can do, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, you do have to pay. Yeah, pay um, and as far as personal research goes, I would really recommend uh, Dimension Twenty. One of their DMs, um, Brennan. I can't remember his last name to save my life, but Brennan is really good at that improv stuff, where um, you know he'll just ask for random roles uh, to have a character. Um, do certain actions, whether or not it allows them to be a villain, it doesn't matter. But if I'm, you know, looking for information or if I'm, you know, just I'm meeting people and trying to decide how charismatic I'm going to be in that interaction, he he's really great about um, that sort of like what it takes to be a good DM. So I would look to him as an example. Um, otherwise, running my uh, events, we usually do an hour and a half. Um, and that's pretty, pretty much where my teens start uh, getting fidgety and wanting to, 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 do, to go do something. Um, but we do a zero session. We just did a zero session um, here at the end of December. And we'll start our campaign, a new adventure in January. And then hopefully, if everything goes well, if everybody makes the right decisions, we'll end that right around the time that school gets out. And we'll start another adventure for the summer. Um, if you are really daunted by the idea of doing something that long. There are what's called one shots, which are meant to be completed uh, in an hour to two hours. Uh, and there's a ton of free um, resources for that sort of thing. D and D beyond um, are two or is one place. And then if you search for D and D one shots, 
there's a wealth of resources. People have posted things to Google Drives and that sort of thing, specifically to share stuff that they've written and want to share for free. Um, you can also get uh, D and D's like official books. This happens to be um, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which is a nice uh, resource. But then they also have published adventures like Candlekeep Mysteries. Um, we did the first couple adventures in Candlekeep, and I realized my kids weren't quite um, skilled enough to make uh, some of the decisions that Candlekeep requires. So we transitioned to a one shot and then did a zero uh, session in December to start up this next adventure, which is more beginner friendly. Um, and a lot of those adventures that are written by somebody who's not Wizards of the West Coast, just like a random D&D fan, will say, you know, this is a beginner level one adventure that by the end of the adventure, you'll be level two or something like that. It will kind of give you a guide um, to how much you'll be doing in that adventure. So if you start out as a level one and you end as a level one, you didn't do much, but maybe that's okay if it's a beginner session and you're just trying to kind of figure out how the kids work together. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the can like the candle keep stuff, you start at level one and by the time you end candle keep, I think you're level eight. So mm -hmm. you do a lot of stuff. There's a lot of challenges. Um, it's a multi session, yeah. Yes, in multiple sessions, you would do that over the course of a couple of months. So, um, yeah, that's those are kind of the mechanics. And in terms of um, maybe promoting it and that sort of thing, it was. Uh, incredibly popular at the start in March when we were on spring break. We had, I think, 16 people uh, at each of those sessions. Once school came back into session, we went down to about eight. Our average was eight um, for quite a while at, at uh, uh, school breaks. It would bump up a little bit. Um, but a lot of the kids, when I asked them, hey, could you take flyers to school or different groups that you're in and share those with your friends? A lot of the kids said, well, I'm already here because my friends don't want to hear me talk about D&D &D anymore. So I'm here to do my D&D thing. Um, so I've reached out to a couple of the gaming, uh, like, sort of stores, Gauntlet, um, Hobby Town, those sort of places where uh, people may play or buy supplies for those games and uh, had flyers and posters hung up there and handed out there. And that's helped out um, a lot as well. So I would say... Um, even if your kids that do attend and do like it, um, if they don't have friends they can share it with, there are other ways to capitalize, um, you know, asking church groups or different things like that um, to, to, to promote a teen activity has been pretty helpful. Um, otherwise, I think that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts um, of what I've done. So if, I, if anybody has questions, um, that's, I think the best practice really is to just do it, to just try it. Um, so that that session zero, if anybody's interested in joining, um, that I think that's really the best way to just like rip the bandaid off and figure out how to play it. And that's definitely yeah. If, if yeah, um, yeah, anybody has any other questions, go ahead and type them in the questions section. I got a few here <clears throat> that I've been gathering up. Um, yeah, that session zero that you're talking about, that I think is something and knowing from playing um, myself. Oftentimes, your first session is not playing at all. It's figuring out the characters. And for me and my friends, we can sit there for like three hours mm -hmm. going through the books, figuring out what I want to do, talking about it, hanging out, whatever. Um, yeah. And then the second time is when you actually start adventuring. I think that's something that it, it's um, important to understand that you're not going to have people coming in right away and jumping into this. Now we are in this tavern and we're going to meet. And, you know, mm -hmm. this mysterious stranger, blah, 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 that's not going to be the, you're not going to jump into that right away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so someone did have a question, and he kind of answered it, um, about how do you come up with a story or a plot? Sure. So there, you know, because that can be for some people, like, you know, like I said, for myself, coming up with a backstory just for my own character, I'm, I'm a little bad at that. Um, but also coming up with a whole storyline seems crazy intimidating, but as you and answered that they're out yeah. there already. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that Wizards of the Coast has published that if you are like, I don't know enough about the rules to know what I'm bending or breaking, um, you can certainly rely on those. There's a lot, like I said, um, that people have written on their own as fans uh, of D&D. &D. Um, and then once you're kind of comfortable in your uh, DMing, 
like for example my boyfriend's uh dm uh for another group and he will literally just read a book you know like read lord of the rings for example and just create a world um based on that he is yeah he's sort of um a savant in that way he's uh able to well okay this this one's not quite a lord of the rings uh monster but this one's a, a close enough allegory we could say that this is the bow rock you know these sort of things um and setting up those challenges and stuff knowing when uh a character needs needs to be met with some resistance versus oh this is just a pasture that we're going to wander through until suddenly you know um there's all sorts of versions of that there's not really a wrong wrong path so yeah yeah um so let's see here um yeah. Okay, so I've got some lots of good questions coming in here. <clears throat> We're, um, so we've got plenty of time to ask any questions. Anybody wants to know more details of how this is done and everything, definitely put your questions in there. Uh, you had mentioned that you started off with 16 kids, but sometimes only eight. How do you deal with um, them coming in and out? I mean, sure. we have 16, potentially 16 teens all playing one adventure. That's that's huge. But how do you, yeah. so that's, that's, so that's, that's a lot of people like, Mm -hmm. trying to try and keep it more smaller and more focused but how would you also deal with okay the kids that showed up last week aren't showing up this week mm -hmm. what do you do with those characters that now aren't aren't there's nobody here to play them at the moment sure that's yeah <laughs> yeah so uh i my approach to it and again i don't think that there's a wrong approach but my approach is um if there was maybe some sort of uh spell book or you know like a piece of uh loot that they need for the adventure we all have just agreed that the magic hand of the dm will randomly assign that that piece to whoever is present um and i've kind of joked with my teens that have become regulars that if so and so joins us they'll just teleport to join us in the adventure uh the one that we did most recently was a space themed adventure so teleporting worked nicely for that um otherwise i kind of write them into joining you know like as you enter the wood you notice off to the left there's a small half orc half orc who are you know and like uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves and join the party um and if they don't show up the next time we kind of say you know like oh were they in the fallen you know like we'll remember them as we move forward in this adventure that kind of thing um so it's not usually too disruptive um although if you can kind of cultivate a regular group those things dissipate so yeah yeah or sometimes maybe saying oh they've gone off on a little side quest, side quest. they had to go and do something and um we'll see if they'll join us later on maybe if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they're uh coming back or not that's, that's a good idea yeah all right what else do we have here um so 16, yeah, someone asked, I think it's similar to what I was asking a lot of kids, do you have more than one DM for 16 people, but it's just you? Yeah, okay. yeah it's just me. For, for the one session that I had, or the two sessions I had 16 kids, what I did was um, get a random number generator and assign them order. So no matter what we were doing, like not just if we were fighting a villain, but no matter what we were doing, we would go in order and let those kids like that the next kid in line decide what we would do so are we going to take the left fork or the right fork and then the next kid would decide you know if we're going to engage the enemy or try to go around them you know like all that sort of thing so everybody gets a chance to do something um and that way if i let 16 kids all talk and try to decide what to do we would never get past the first action so i find that that ordering um ordering them right away and then using that order also for battle you know as you're attacking villains kind of cycling through that so everybody gets a chance to do something and we're not letting you know the one or two really loud kids dominate the conversation yeah that's a lot of, a lot of kids to corral yeah um have you ever considered or tried having the teens dm or have they expressed any interest in that yeah so i had uh the adventure picked out that i would dm in january and when we did our zero session i kind of proposed to them the idea you know i have an adventure ready to go we can do our zero session or one of you could choose you know like one of the two that kind of seemed into doing dms one of you two could dm the adventure and they were like no i i think i'm i think i want to still just play a little bit and kind of figure it out and then maybe next time i would um be involved 
Um, the only uh, hesitancy, maybe from like an admin uh, perspective, would be making sure that it's the right kid doing the DM, um, because if it's a you know one of the chaotic kind of players, um, it may not be as well run. Um, and therefore less fun for the other kids. But if you've got a, you know, a studious kid who always is on top of how many hit points are left or what kind of um, weapons and actions each player can take, something like that, that kid may be a good candidate for a DM. You just kind of want to make sure that it stays fun for everybody because, of course, if it's not fun, they won't come back. So. Right, right. And DMing, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. Here, yep. I think, yeah. And you need to be a certain kind of, person that's into that like not everybody who plays wants to do that yeah yeah <laughs> not everybody the dms wants that wants to play too and i know in our group um sometimes people i play for some reason there's always certain two people who are always running it and the other ones are like no i'm good playing <laughs> yep, yep. um let's see here i need Oh, oh, so it says, it's very, I, I think this is a um, comment about when you're talking about the kids coming in and out. Um, yeah. Someone's playing one weekly game that's pretty much a sandbox because adulting life. Oh, yeah. People drop in and out, it's available, and things happen if you come across it, like a sandbox open world video game. As a newish that's player, it helped me learn the relatively low stakes to the group. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sandbox would be a, another good search term for folks who are super familiar. Uh, sandbox worlds would allow, it's kind of like Minecraft, right? Like it's, there's a lot of interactable things um, so that people can learn mechanics. And like they mentioned, uh, in and out is much less of a problem. If, you know, maybe, and maybe a kid can only stay for half an hour, they can't stay for an hour and a half. So those sandbox experiences work nicely there too, yeah. Yeah, jump in and just get a get a feel for it, get a taste for yeah. it. Yeah. Um ah, okay, so here's a good question. How do you get the money to start the program? What are the startup costs? Uh and to keep it interesting, you have to keep buying new things. I know D D books can be pretty pricey. <laughs> um, yeah. You mentioned the dice can so so what all um physical stuff would you need to uh, start a game? Yeah. So bare bones, like if I, you know, had only the things that I could uh, personally afford, you know, like if I was providing supplies or something, maybe a $25 budget, something really, you know, thin. Um, really all you need is a single set of those dice, the D20, D12, D10, a single set of those dice. Um, you can find adventures for free online. And if your library is able to print on paper that's, you know, like 11 by 17 or eight by 14, something like that, you can print maps on that size of paper that are just just fine. Um, and that's usually what I do actually is print on uh, like legal size or uh, ledger. Um, and so the the startup costs can be really pretty low. Um, in terms of the once the, the group kind of took off, our cataloging department thought, well, maybe we should give the D&D &D books another whirl. Um, previously, we had owned a player's handbook and some of the basics and they tended to walk away. Um, we have not had that experience with them this time. So I'm not sure if there's more of a culture of, I really enjoyed it. You know, like I got inspired to, to do it because of Stranger Things or whatever. I really enjoyed it. I should return the book so the next person can enjoy it too. Um, I'm not sure, but we haven't lost any of the books yet. So in terms of that, um, that cost, there's been zero. Um, the uh, adventures also can be really low cost. You know, it, um, you can get PDFs for free, but you can also get PDFs for, you know, five, eight dollars, depending on the author. Um, mini figs, you can print off on a 3D printer if your library has one of those. Um, otherwise, I don't really find that mini figs are necessarily like a requirement. Um, but a lot of times kids will be just fine using chess pieces or other board game pieces to represent their character, especially if you have a jumble, a random jumble, and they can kind of pick one that they feel like represents them. Um, but yeah, I think the, the startup cost could be really quite low if you um, weren't able to purchase, you know, the the official uh, Wizards of the Coast adventures, et cetera. So. Yeah, that's not necessary. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea about the figures because I know, um, you can buy like a, a a rogue figure or a wizard figure or whatever, and mm -hmm. they can in get they can 
add up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just using anything to just, you're just marking yourself on a map. It's not really important what's in your head. It's what you're really, you know, imagining. Yes, where, where you're at. at. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it does not take much to, yeah, to get started with it. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Ah, okay. I'm um, talking about how to do one of these. Um, how much time does it take for you um, to, between games for preparing? Um, like how much dedicated time time do you set aside for preparing for each session? Um, preparing for each session, uh, maybe an hour. It's a little bit tough to um, to estimate because um, at this point I have a nice backlog, a nice pad of those adventures lined up for the next you know, the next one and the next one. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say maybe an hour per session uh, at, at preparation in terms of making sure if there's any monsters I'm unfamiliar with or um, a game mechanic uh, that I'm not familiar with, making sure that I know how that works. Um, but mostly the time that you spend is reading that adventure to know kind of where it ends so you can help steer um, your kids um maybe the time uh that it takes to read uh i wouldn't say like don't don't like read the dictionary this way you know like don't read the player's handbook necessarily um mm -hmm. but watching the real plays and the um the pot listening to the podcasts of people playing um at least for me was a really great way to familiarize myself with gameplay mm -hmm. and um mechanics and those sort of things because just because one group plays it that way doesn't mean that that's like the solid only way to play it so you could listen to three different groups play the same adventure and it may result in a different um and end result so um i think I found, I found the podcast and real plays um more informative that way than just strictly like sitting down and reading a player's handbook um and things like the podcast you can listen to um on a commute or you know when you're doing other tasks depending on what you're yeah, reading uh, through the adventure that you selected is a good idea. So, you know, what's supposed to happen definitely, but it is very different than seeing people play it or participating in it. Of course, mm -hmm. um, I would recommend, I mean, you mentioned things like critical role and, and that may be, well, if you got three or four hours, just sit in and yeah. type. They, they are not a clicky. They, they're just a yeah. Long critical long. role. Um, is not a yeah. So it's, it's, so it's different. You want to just really get immersed into something and, and they do. Yeah. Like they're, if you look up their YouTube things, it's like here's a three and a half, four hour session. Yeah. In one, in one night that they do it. This is their regular thing that they do. Um, and it's that's interesting to see people who've been playing it for years and years and how they do it. But I would also look for they have done some things and other people have done, um, you know, one shots bringing in other celebrities or people yeah. who've never played before to see how other um, newbies have been um, introduced to it and figured it out. Yeah. Um, I've had fun watching that sometimes happen where they say, yeah, we're going to do a special thing for, you know, a charity or just because this is happening yeah. or whatever. And then it's just a one or two hours and it's a specific, yeah, just this one day, just this one adventure. Um, yep. And you can see the people who know who've done it before and the mix of people who've never done it. And they're like, so what yeah. do I do about? It's okay. You roll the 20, your D6 yeah. is a damage, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a role in the family has a, a guest episode with Brennan from D20 and he Brennan from D20 is actually the DM for their group. Um, but I think role in the family is a really nice uh, kind of snapshot because all the kids that are playing, you kind of get an idea how to interact with like what what kinds of reactions you might get from kids um, and also like a natural way to coach kids through the decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. So that yeah, roll in the family is just on YouTube, and I want to say they're like forty-five minute episodes. They're not too bad. Okay. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, someone wants to know, and I know you're talking about doing the teens. Have you have you or else uh, and somewhere else in the library done any sessions with adults, or have you are you thinking about doing that? Um, I think I've only, well, I've, uh, I've only had two people reach out and ask if the teen group would accept adults. Um, and at this point, I've just said no, because we're trying to cultivate some teen programs. Um, 
And I don't know um, our adult librarian. I don't know that she has necessarily gotten feedback that Dungeons and Dragons is a, of interest to, to adults. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you have a community member who comes to you and says, hey, do you have, do you have a D&D &D program or do you have, you know, hey, what would you like to DM the group? I would love to have you start, you know, like if you want to DM, yeah. start the adventure, I can set up a room for you, you know, like kind of um, host it and uh, foster it that way. Um, yeah. But yeah, I couldn't say that I necessarily have a, a ton of interest in it from the adult side. It depends on your community and what you put yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, like you said, there are, um, you know, there's places here in town that already that, well, that people meet to do it like gauntlet games mm -hmm. and there's, oh, what is it the new mana cafe we've got yes. some yeah that is a new gaming um cafe here in lincoln yeah. there's another one that i can't remember anyways so yeah. where you know adults can go and drink a beer and play their game for right well th that is a, an important distinction that we wanted to make with the library programs that um they were beginner friendly and welcoming mm -hmm. environment because sometimes the um, adult groups, whether they meet on their own or meet at one of those um, gaming is like establishments can be kind of uh, gatekeeping and bro centric, um, if you will. So we wanted to make sure that um, we advertised in a way that it will be kids, like it will be teens. We will be nice to beginners. We're not going to, you know, kind of turn our noses up or anything. We're going to be helpful. Um, and it's not really a place for like know-it-alls, right? Like we're all learning together. And we just, we kind of created that culture for ourselves. Um, so it, it, for the libraries, it was an important distinction to be open and welcoming to that, that right. sector. So where you're, 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 the, you're, you know, doing specifically team work anyway. So that's what you would focus on. Yeah. yeah. And there may be other libraries out there. I'm sure there are a bunch of yeah. so got adult D and D groups too. Cause um, yeah. like you said, stranger things and all these TV shows and things that are, <laughs> some adults are just learning it yeah. discovering it themselves and might want to get started and do well and yeah, yeah. So, yeah some of our adult staff were saying you know i i would love to join a DD group i tried to play when i was a kid but uh the boys wouldn't let me so i mean there is yeah there is a an argument to be made that adults might enjoy it um i just haven't necessarily gotten um enough feedback to say like yes let's try it but yeah um all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, talking about the figures, someone says yes about the 3D printing. Um, if your library does 3D printing, I highly recommend doing a collaboration with the Makerspace. Yeah. Um, giving players the option to 3D print a mini with the likeness of their character is a great way to immerse them in the game and generate excitement for the program. Um, yes, there are. Hero Forge is the big one. Oh gosh, Hero Forge! Don't get me started on that. I can go crazy. Yeah. With Hero Forge is a place where a, a website where you can go and they will 3D print for you and stuff. Um, but you can yeah. also get from there, and there's other mini fig places online, mini fig factory, yeah. where you can get just the STL files, the files that then print yeah. out onto your own um, 3D printer. And I know lots of libraries now have 3D printers. It's a thing. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, get them involved in that too uh oh here's interesting someone said for um staff oh wow that's so different okay um at this library who's the library system in nashville also here okay. um someone in the team section started discord for staff to play off work hmm. oh yeah um yeah so when i pitched the idea of doing a dnd &D group um at first one of my coworkers is a dm for their friends and I was like, hey, can you kind of, can you run a couple sessions for me so I get a, a good feel of what I might be up against? Um, and so it it was uh, a coworker and I, and then we put out a call to the system, like who would want to join us off off the clock to just play D and D for fun? Um, and it would, you know, we'd all kind of be library uh, cohorts. Um, Discord certainly could be a, a fun way to do that. Um, we happen to do it at Village Inn, just like, you know, OG <laughs> Village Inn at 1130 scenario. But yeah, uh, especially if you're all uh, into books, the Candlekeep Mysteries is centered in a library. So there you go. Perfect for all us librarians because you have to look into that one too. <laughs> Um, someone says they do, this other library is um, saying uh, they have an all ages magic the gathering group, so you can do things that are, yeah, um, all ages, yeah. 
Um, we also have a kids D&D group and a try starting an adult D&D group, but they just need a, a, a DM. Yeah, same thing. Somebody needs to run. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and someone has, I have another question here. Um, still have a lot more time. If anyone has any other questions or ideas or thoughts, go ahead and share them. Um, someone else, someone here is sharing um, uh, something called The Quiet Year. Um, mm -hmm. It's its own game, but it's been interesting for building a map collaboratively and taking some weight off the DM. So the quiet year is what it's called. So that can be something to look into. I wonder if I'm spelling it wrong. This, the results that are coming up are like Metal Gear Solid, so maybe I'm in the wrong. The quiet year, like like it's a map game. Um, oh, okay. We define the struggles of post-apocalyptic community and attempt to build something good in their quiet year. Oh, like okay. sil silent gear? Silence, yes, quiet, yeah. Q -U -I -E. oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. That'd be something else we could try, yeah. Um, kind of a, a sandbox type experience it sounds like oh no is it oh it's snowing again dang it <laughs> oh, <gosh. Fish. laughs> um heart of the deer unicorn is the website for it it's a map drawing game about the struggles of community living after the collapse of civilization Interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. What we got here. Um, do you have any? Um, oh yeah. The person says yes. It's a map making game. You play it. We play it to make a map for the campaign. That's kind of like okay. a free your session thing you could do is like yeah, crowdsource. Before we play the game. <laughs> That's yeah, cool. I like that crowdsource map and build the world that way. That's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, all right, here we go. Let's see. Um, do you have any suggestions of ways to make D and D more accessible to people with disabilities or other historically marginalized identities? Certainly. So part yeah, of that would be uh, marginalized identities. Uh, we always encourage our players to share their pronouns. So if the pronouns are maybe even different from who they are in person, um, that we can address them with the right pronouns in the game. Um, mm -hmm. As far as um, physical manipulation uh, and that sort of thing, um, there are what, what are called dice jails um, and different uh, dice rollers. So if it's a matter of physical manipulation of dice, there are different um, items out there that you can investigate to help people roll dice. Um, for visual, um, that uh, might be printing the, the grids of the map um, in larger font and pasting them together so you have a larger, more visible map. Um, but yes, that is a good question. Um, there are certain uh, virtual platforms also that might make uh, playing more accessible um, where you are kind of playing a Zoom game. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember what. It might just be called D, D20. Roll20. So Roll20 is a virtual platform where you can load the map and everybody sees the map. And then you're kind of playing, like interacting as though you would interact on Zoom. Um, so that I may be that one. Yeah, it was. It became very big and, and recommended, of course, when the pandemic started and people yeah. were wanting to play with their same groups they've always been playing with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also Dungeon Masters Guild, and it, I think DMSGuild.com is the website, um, and that's a lot of those folks that are like, I I've DM'd for 20 years, and here's the experiences and things that I can share for this conversation. Um, so you might find some stuff there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's other kind of identities that I've missed. I mean, uh, cutting out the race, moving to species, some of that sort of stuff has um, 
that thing like I was I really like how they started when they, when they made that change. I like the the new how it's been done. Yeah, they just um, the Wizards of the Coast has addressed that themselves already. So yeah, so that's well, to pay attention to as well. I mean, we're talking about the books, and I didn't really mention there are different editions. We are on yes five e five e right now. So there are previous editions of the books, the player's handbook, the DM um, guide, uh, monsters manual, and all the adventures. So mm -hmm. you will want to pay attention to what edition when you're looking mm -hmm. up things to make sure it's if it is something older that you understand that, but the rules might be different. They they the, some of the rules and things did change from edition to edition, and yeah. sometimes drastically. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you see the classic red box <laughs> from way back when it first started, that's totally yeah. different than what we're doing today. Um, so pay attention to that whole which edition is is something yeah. um, created based on like those the ones that people um, just out there have made up their own. They should somewhere yeah. indicate this is using the whatever edition rules. So you yeah. know. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure on Dungeon Masters Guild you can search for things that are just fifth edition, or you know, if you wanted to play an older version, you can search for things that way as well too. Um, yeah, oh, some people do have their, you know, they love their previous version of something. Yeah. For the reason that that's, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Perfect. Well, and there's the newest, uh, the Spell Jammer set. Uh, a lot of people have found uh, more confusing. Some people have found it less confusing. Our group has elected to choose the fifth edition to just stick with that. So it really yeah. it depends on what you are uh, interested in, maybe as a group, or if you just, as the DM, want to make that call and just say, you know, sorry, teenagers, we're going to do 5e. I'm pulling that card. Um, or if you want to vote, however. But yeah, there's all sorts of ways to play. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Someone is asking, and I'm going to do that now because I'm bringing it up again. Um, Oh, because I had it and then I lost it. Oops. All right, I'm obviously good. All right. Um, oh, okay. Someone is suggesting here uh, the DD compendium.com DM resources accessibility and inclusion. Um, and I will share the, uh, do a little, there, I just sent out the link that everyone should be able to see that. I'll also put it in the chat. We have multiple places where we can send things out. Um, but this, so this is what, answering to that question, handling sensitive content, mm -hmm. inclusive gaming, physical and cognitive accommodations, respectful representation, of minority characters. Oh, I guess here we can. Yeah, excellent. And a lot of this, like the tools that I found that I am sharing with you, I just found by the good old Google search, you know, figuring out what key terms um, to use. So that's excellent. I love that. And we're there. Um, ah, so here's a question. Uh, what is the lowest age group you'd recommend for D&D? I and mean, you're doing teens, but um, mm -hmm. I know I've seen people do do it yeah. for uh, younger kids, even like a very yeah. very young version. But um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think how young. Role in the family, I think, has like maybe a ten year old is the youngest. Um, and I did have a teen bring a much younger sibling, like maybe a six-year-old sibling. Um, and the six-year-old did was not grabbing it. Um, but I think my adventure being aimed at teens, that, that was kind of bound to happen. Um, sure. I think if you could find the right adventure, especially being guided by some resources like Role in the Family, you might be able to do it for like upper elementary school age kids. But it's really... Um, a matter of how well they're able to work with a team and to realize, you know, like the, oh, the tavern innkeeper told us we have to find the goblin's goal to save the village. And if they're not realizing that that's the goal and they're going off in a different direction, that, you know, the kind of understanding those cues is really what, what makes the age appropriate. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, someone had asked for, um, yeah, I, I know I've seen, I saw somebody start, I think they did, they have modified D&D for the younger, very younger kids. The small kids mm -hmm. can play board games, but you've got to think of it in that type of, you know, they're very much simpler <laughs> and they're going to yeah. need a real, yeah. Um, and someone just said, there's a separate guide series um, by Wizards of the Coast specifically made for younger players. Yeah. That depends on yeah, how long we're, how long we're talking. Um, someone did ask for the link to the Quiet Year game. So I did uh, send that out into the chat and the questions, um, okay. the Quiet Year. Uh, and the, because the link, um, someone um, here, okay, another question. Can you stop a quest at any time and pick up later? Um, I don't see why you couldn't. Um, I mean, if it if it was a matter of, um, you know, maybe kids are only wanting to attend during the summer break, and then once school starts, um, that you know they're unavailable because of uh, extracurriculars or whatever. Um, you can certainly join back in the adventure and say like <laughs> previously on Troll for Initiative and kind mm -hmm. of you know recap what you learned what you gained, that sort of thing. And if there's new people joining, you can write them into the story. If people left, you can, you know, help them exit the story. Um, yeah, I don't see why you couldn't, um, but yeah, I think your moment. It depends on when people decide I'm done for the night, I have to go, whatever. Yeah. And you know what, we will pause here and we'll pick it up next time, just like a TV show or. <laughs> yeah, well, and our, our adventures are, just the twice monthly meetings and so we that's regular enough that they ne haven't forgotten what happened two weeks ago um and we've been able to do a con like one consistent adventure through that whole time um but yeah if you were to stop for longer like for a month or two months um it might be worth doing a recap or something but that might yeah. be tough gotta remember what happened last season <laughs> uh yeah. so yeah. for the quiet years everybody in the discord is going to love hearing that so thanks got a little yeah. connection <laughs> Um, uh, another resource someone is mentioning is the um, fifth edition wiki, and I've got the mm -hmm. link here to d and d5e.wiki.com. Yeah, yeah um, that's a good one. That it is good um, for player characters, uh, building them, leveling up spells, etc. Um, you just have to watch out for uh, the different editions and sticking to what the game is like. Yeah. Yeah, 5e tools is another good one got like the the uh, best year like the beast book uh items spells all sorts of stuff so if you've got um kind of a sandbox environment you want to throw in some some wild cards you can certainly find some stuff that way yeah yeah all right it is a little after 11 a.m central time here um we did start a little after 10 a.m so that's okay um anybody have any uh we're almost to the end of our hour um anybody have any uh last minute desperate questions or anything you want to ask of caitlin or of anyone else in the group <laughs> who's not here today with us or any suggestions or thoughts or ideas you have get it into the question section of the ghost webinar interface i've gotten through all of them that were in there yep so far um, and as I said, we are recording this, so um, you can always go back and look at the recording um, for any of the links and everything that are in the slides. Uh, I will try. There are a lot of good resources that were suggested. When I put up the archive recording, I will try and include um, links to all the different things that were suggested today. The, um, anything that's not already that, that, that people that you all in the audience have suggested, so that you can, anyone who goes to listen to this later. Can access all of them as well. Um, oh, here's a good last. I think this would be a good question just to wrap things up. Maybe. Um, how do you handle regular, regularly disruptive players? Do you have regular? <laughs> have you? Had um, yeah, that's a good question. So, I had uh, one teen who um, was struggling with some social cues and things like that. So he would just randomly interject and, you know, want to want to take over action. Um, and so that was one of those times where we instituted the order 
um, rule. So even though there were only eight kids there, I still said, you know, all right, number one, uh, you know, it's Joan's turn. So Joan, what action would you like to take? And then when he would try to interject, I would remind him that it's Joan's turn. And those things would sort of um, kind of dissipate. Um, it's tough to balance the the kids who are really disruptive with the kids who are there to have fun because if somebody is really disruptive it tends to not be fun for the other kids um so i i tend to focus my energy and my storytelling etc on the kids who are having fun um because i think a lot of times too the disruptive behavior is to get attention so if they're being starved of that attention they kind of quiet down and that's a little bit more of a hot psychology take but um i think that's a a more productive way to handle it um the number order tool working particularly well if you do like a talking stick or you know whatever way to kind of trade around the group um i just have found that the number order is really uh like nonpartisan. there's nobody playing favorites this is what the random generator right. has decided yeah, it's, so. it's, literally it's not my decision it was the number generator <laughs> yeah 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 so so we're just doing things with um uh some i would say some co-players also cast uh like silent spells or you know like wrapped him up in duct tape or something like that so that he couldn't speak you know so then it'd be like well uh you know jude uh you can't speak because actually uh you know joan has tied you up remember like she she gagged you so you actually you can't speak until somebody cuts the gag, you know, like those sort of like jokey things that maybe the co-players can kind of play into the story um, mm -hmm. sometimes work well or um, a trade-off maybe with like, um, you know, like I, I will let you roll to see if you become friends with the squirrel, but then we've got to move back to the puzzle. But that's Joan's, Joan wanted to, wanted us to solve the puzzle. So you can roll and if you fail, tough, we got to move back to the puzzle. Sometimes trade-offs are worth it too, so. Um, and here's a related question um, to disruptive, but it's a specific type of disruption, which um, I think you think, and we'll explain this to you. Um, how do you deal with potential murder hobos that might start to arise in the group? And for those that know murder hobos, that's people that just, they don't really do anything about how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to work this together? They just want to go in and kill everybody. Kill everybody. <laughs> right. <A backslash. laughs> and don't even think about the story and whatever, they're just here to beat things up. Um, uh, yeah, so for my group, as we're learning, it, that was a useful time for me to be like, well, the invisible hand of the DM has protected this individual from dying. It doesn't matter what you do, he won't die. You can't kill him, so what else shall we try? Um, or, you know, like moving, once you're more comfortable with those improv elements, you can move characters around um, and say, you know, um, well, it seems like the door that, that this person is in is locked. So, I, if, oof, we either got to find the key or move on to a different thing. You know, like there's some yeah. things that you can kind of make up um, and some lacking in that sort of skill. Mm -hmm. I have just said, you know, the invisible hand of the DM has told you this might be useful. Maybe you don't want to light it on fire um, <laughs> and then just leave it at that. So they're still trying to problem solve what else they should do with that item, um, mm -hmm. but they know that they can't destroy it. Yeah, distract or deflect them to something else. That yeah, is actually, what? Yeah, having another, another. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, you don't kill the guy who's giving you the quest just because you want to. <laughs> right, right, right. How are you going to get your reward when you're done? Yeah. <laughs> well, and my my big struggle is no matter where we're at, they want to find an animal to make friends with. <laughs> Which is fine, but like I said, our last quest was in space, so there were no animals to befriend. So that, yeah, that was, I intentionally put us in space so that maybe they would be like, you know, there's no animals to be, to befriend here, let's focus on the quest. But every every room was like, I cast, I, I you know, I use animal handling to see if there are any animals to befriend in the room. I was like, no, it's still space. It's, you know? it's interesting that they're just kind of focusing on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we'll start wrapping things up here. It's almost 10 after. Um, and we've had a great conversation, great ideas and thoughts here. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for um, talking to us about this, what you're doing with the library. I know there are many libraries are doing D&D groups for teens yeah. um, and kids and adults out there, I'm sure. Um, and this is, I think, an awesome like, 
here are the basics of what you need to know and how you yes. can do it yourself. And um, thank you everyone for the great conversation and the other tips and tricks and ideas. Um, I am gonna bring back presenter control to my screen. There it is. All right, so here is, this is that uh, quiet year page. And like I said, I will share the links to all these things everyone recommended and suggested when we put up the archive. But uh, that's the quiet year. It's a very uh, kind of cool thing to do. Um, D and D compendium about accessible inclusive gaming, uh, the D and D fifth edition wiki, and there's many other ones too. I'm sure um, that I'll make sure I include. Yes. Uh, so I right, got some thank yous. This was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you everybody for being here with us this morning. I'm going to go back to our Encompass Live main page. Um, whatever search engine of choice you'd like to use, if you type Encompass Live in the name of our show, it's the only thing called that on the internet so far. No one else is allowed to use it. <laughs> um, this is our upcoming shows that we have in the schedule, but here I'm just going to show you our archive links are right here. Um, and there we go. And the most recent one at the top of the page. Uh, Today's show will be there, should be up and done by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, Got to go to webinar and YouTube to cooperate with me. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's up. There'll be a link, here's last week, a link to the recording, a link to um, Caitlin's slides, and as I said, some extra links that I'll add for all the things that people have shared um, today. We also push out our information onto um, Facebook and Twitter. Um, here's our Encompass Live Facebook page if you'd like to use Facebook. We post reminders, here's a reminder to log into today's show, meet our speakers, and then when our recordings are available, uh, here we go, last week's um, recordings, we announced those on here as well. So if you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like there, um, or look for our hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation that we use elsewhere. Uh, while I'm here on the archives, I will show you there is a search feature if you want to see if there's a show on any other topic. Um, you can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months. You want to make sure it's something current. Um, and it's because this is our full archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way down. If you look at the size, you can see that it's, this is a long, long page. Uh, these show archives go back to when Encompass Live premiered, which was in January 2009. So this, this is our first show of 2023. And this is the beginning, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, of the 15th year of Encompass Live. Wow. You've got now 14 years worth of recordings here to go through. So uh, if you do watch something on here, that's great. As long as you have a place to host them, we'll always have them up there. Everything's on YouTube right now. Um, you know, we're librarians, but we do keep things available for historical purposes. But just pay attention to a the broadcast date of anything. Um, many shows will be great and stand the test of time and be good, useful information, but lots of things will become old, outdated, resources and services may no longer exist anymore, uh, products may have changed drastically, uh, people who worked at the library 10 years ago probably possibly aren't there anymore, <laughs> so just pay attention to a date whenever you are watching any of our archive shows. All right, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, next week, our topic will be the best new teen reads of 2022, um, as determined by our coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Library Commission, Sally Snyder. Um, she's going to be talking about the books that she has come across that she thought are great to share with you. Um, so we can sign up for that for next week and any of our other upcoming shows. Uh, Sally's this Best New Teen Reads of her is a kind of companion to her Best New Children's books, which she did back in November. So if you are any sort of you know, children slash teen librarian, you can go back and watch the recording and see her slides. And she has, excuse me, handout um, with more all of the publisher information of all the books that she talks about um, for both her children's and her teen um, sessions that she does for us every year. Um, so that wraps up today. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing. This was a great session. Um, I'm glad to get the word out and hopefully get more teens and people playing D&D. As I said, I've been playing it for a long, long time myself, so I'm really thrilled to have you on for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, and yeah, welcome to the uh, 2023 uh, first episode of Encompass Life of the Year.
Hope you have a good week. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you on a future episode of Campus Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>